chapter forty one of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter forty one confirmation strong colonel trevilian did not go as a prison guard before the morning came he was burning with fever and racked with pain the exposure of the day before had been too much for him it is pneumonia the doctor said briefly and they fought for his life on the sixth day he said the crisis is past he will live but mrs trevilian yes doctor he ought not to think of work for months this will leave him very feeble they were having a consultation in the room adjoining the one in which the patient lay virginia sat on the bed for want of a chair the doctor had the far-seeing eyes of a sympathetic physician and all of his opportunities for observation the straits of the family had not escaped his notice though they were never obtruded upon him miss virginia he said abruptly looking up from the pills he was rolling out on the reverse side of a plate could you teach yes sir dr mayo looked at her keenly have you ever taught no sir how do you know you can then people can always do what they have to do she answered i want to teach i know a school that wants a teacher where she asked eagerly about seven miles from here could i get it i think so they asked me to look out for them but it is a country school i wouldn't care for that i'm a country girl he had forgotten that people always forgot it they don't pay much you would have to hunt up your scholars and take your chances about collecting it wouldn't pay you more than twenty dollars a month probably twenty dollars a month seemed a small fortune to her just then i'd hunt up the scholars they say there are some pretty hard boys in the school he seemed determined to discourage her the last teacher was turned out i reckon you'd better think it over dr mayo she said i would take them if they were comanche indians i reckon you will be able to hold them how soon could you go to-day he looked at her with a new interest she was plucky certainly and you raised in the lap of luxury he said and southern women supposed to be drones added miss nanny sometimes they seem to be queen bees he remarked without looking up from the roll he was chopping into little pieces to be moulded into spheres and sometimes they are just plain workers said virginia or want to be virginia dear do you think you had better try it it seemed a great undertaking to mrs trevilian for a girl to go out into the world to earn a living the women she had known had been used to work but they led sheltered lives at home while doing it i'm not going to try it virginia said i'm going to do it her mother looked at her wistfully she hardly knew her daughter these days it was easily arranged dr mayo took her out and helped her make up her school he knew she needed the place and then he liked her spirit he promised to call for her friday afternoon he would be out in that neighborhood he said and it would be on his way he was a friend of the family and virginia was overwhelmed with his fatherly goodness if ever work was a boon and it has been to countless millions who have never recognized it as such it was to virginia trevilian just then it was more than food and raiment for a needy body it was healing for a sick soul ah work is god's best gift to suffering humanity the primal curse in the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat bread has been transmuted by the divine touch into blessing but mrs trevilian was right virginia was not the same light-hearted girl that had reigned queen of the prairie she was not the brave one that had heartened them all in the days when they had gone forth not knowing whither they went she was cheery yet when anybody was by she was determined still but it seemed as if something within her had died what was it faith or hope or love not love surely she was too young for that her pulses were too bounding not hope no no hope is the very last to leave us all else may go but hope remains could it be faith god forbid whatever it was it had come like a stroke virginia had gone down town for the mail one day a few weeks after they reached jefferson city she had come back with a letter from molly driscoll and gone off in light mood to read it mr driscoll had gone in to the nearest military post near enough to get occasional news from the old neighborhood virginia stayed a long time over the letter 
when she came in she smiled as usual at her mother jested with miss nanny and stroked her father's gray head but it seemed to her mother's keen eyes that from that hour a part of her was gone in truth no matter what she said or did there was ever before her eyes a fragment of molly's letter you know that chandler girl well they say it was the rest of it that was burned into her brain she read molly's letter over till she knew it by heart there are degrees of guilt among scandal-mongers molly would never have originated the story she retailed but she passed it on eagerly without a thought of verification first and when it came to results the difference between the two was infinitesimal virginia had not heard from gordon for weeks she supposed rightly that it was because he did not know where they were and she did not know where to reach him war made everything so uncertain she had tried hard to keep her trust she had spurned the base accusation of emmons barrett as she had spurned him she had borne up against a weight of evidence but with this letter she began to feel that it would crush her down yet the girl had been spirited away somewhere molly said she was sitting listlessly one day in a doorway opening into the back yard in the next room she heard her father say to her mother i heard something to-day that troubles me it is about gordon virginia sat motionless every sense alert every muscle tense miss nanny had gone down town and they thought virginia was with her it was the story told by the male gossip which had drifted down the country it had not lost in transit but the main features were correct there was a beautiful golden-haired woman a child over whom she wept and gordon taking her to a place of safety with less foundation a withering blight has fallen upon many a reputation and laid it low do you think that virginia the girl stepped softly out upon the grass and they finished their talk alone how glad she was she had never told them they might conjecture all they wanted to but they did not know it might have been better if they had known for as she strayed aimlessly about the yard and garden with wretched face and eyes that hardly saw where she was going colonel trevilian was saying to his wife by the eternal if i thought he was anything to virginia i would search him out and make him tell me i hardly think there is anything between them she said i used to feel almost certain that they loved each other but for a year or more she has seemed rather indifferent about him i should hate for her to know anything about it until the story is actually verified yes he said it is a great pity for young girls to know such things even if they exist and of course if there is nothing between them it would be an impertinence for me to write to him my poor old friend i am glad he was under the sod before this came miss nanny and virginia were sitting one day sewing it was a dress for old aunt sylvie and miss nanny was singing the two ladies sang a good deal in those days mostly hymns that breathed of trust for their hearts needed strengthening thus far the lord has led me on to the tune of hebron was mrs trevilian's though she often sang softly sometimes a light surprises dwelling most on the lines and he who feeds the ravens will give his children bread to-day miss nanny was particularly downcast so she sang lighter things snatches of old ballads and plays and serenades they brought back grand prairie days and almost unconsciously she drifted into the swaying rhythmical flow of o oh, sister phoebe how merry were we when we sat under the juniper tree the juniper tree high o oh, high o oh, the juniper tree high o oh the ease with which a voice the note of a song the odor of a flower can cut the cords of time and space and let our souls free seems almost like a hint of powers supernal we were here we are there it has taken but a moment but time is obliterated miss nanny was feeling this a little there was a quaver in her voice now and then as long vanished ones swung into view but virginia ah virginia was under the sweet honeysuckle its fragrance enveloped her a deep voice was thrilling in ear and heart and she had trusted him so aunt nan don't sing that please miss nanny stopped but did not question they were very merciful they knew she was hurt but they did not probe for the ball it was soon after this that virginia had an invitation to go over to fulton about twenty-five miles away to visit the daughter of an old friend of her mother's she was not very anxious to make the visit as they were comparative strangers to her but her mother thought it would do her good and she went not so much to visit sadie lawler as to get away from herself and the ghosts that walked one day they were driving through the grounds of the state lunatic asylum which was located at fulton and was one of the lions to be exhibited 
a number of the patients were out for their afternoon walk a dreary sight at best and this was a woebegone lot virginia could not bear to look at them suddenly an exclamation fell from sadie's lips oh virginia look at that pretty girl virginia turned toward them like a june rose among blasted plants was a fair-haired girl who looked at them with unseen eyes she had a rag baby pressed to her breast it seemed to virginia that her breath would stop something seemed to be holding her throat sadie that looks like a girl i know i wish we could find out something about her what do you want to know i'll ask annie abbott about her her father is one of the physicians there now find out her name and where she is from and who brought her here said virginia feeling her cheeks flush the next day sadie reported she had seen annie in the meantime her name is chandler and she is from the western part of the state somewhere annie says it is an awfully sad story she thinks the doll is her real child the one she lost and she dresses and undresses it and puts it to bed isn't it pitiful i don't think she can be older than we are pitiful oh there are no words that can sadie what did she tell you who brought her here who supports her oh yes i forgot that it was a young federal officer annie says a lieutenant lay she said there seemed to be something rather mysterious about the case he wanted her received under some other name than her own annie didn't remember what it was but dr smith wouldn't do it virginia did not reply the hand was clutching her throat again a day or two after she got home virginia went down for the mail she liked to have the first handling of it two letters were handed to her one for herself and one in the same writing for her father she knew what that one was gordon had written her in his last letter that it was time now they were told she held the letters in her hand and looked at them it seemed as if her gaze might almost burn through the paper and consume its contents this one would ask her father in courteous phrase for his daughter promising to love cherish and be true to her and this one would be filled with all the sweet assurances she had loved to hear and longed for and trusted poor fool a sudden anger possessed her an unreasoning jealous fury that would brook no explanation no delay some envelopes please large size she was saying at the stationer's counter across the room she put the letters in them unopened addressed them in a hand that did not falter placed the stamps with scrupulous exactness and dropped them in then she went home and wept as only a woman can with the ruins of her life about her looked at dispassionately what was the motive that actuated her impulse nay verily her act was the logical outcome of her life and training she had been reared in a strict school of morals by a father who impressed upon her in a crisis of her life that character was above all by a mother who would overthrow cherished plans to guard the virtue of a negro servant in a religious faith which maligned and misrepresented as it has been and charged with all that is stern and forbidding has yet unchallenged in its favour that it makes chaste men and women the girl's whole soul was in revolt every instinct of her pure woman's nature cried out against the wrong that had been done the wrong to her as well as to the other and from her decision there would not be the shadow of turning when mrs trevilian and miss nanny got home from the female prayer meeting she was lying still with a wet cloth over her eyes it was only a headache she said almost any girl can have a headache when her eyes need to be hidden they did not know it but there had been a funeral that day a beautiful form had been laid low and a tomb raised over it on the stone was graven here lies faith End of chapter forty one chapter forty two of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter forty two the fortunes of love and war and this is why virginia trevelyan found work more than meat and drink that winter she used to say afterwards that she thought she would have died if it had not been for that school but probably not for people seldom die except from physical causes there was another thing that helped her through she came back to poverty hollow one saturday afternoon with a light in her eyes such as they had not seen there for many a long day she had just been downtown and she wore her new dress of mazarine blue merino with its tiny brass buttons 
down the close-fitting front and white collar and cuffs that set it off like a modern tailor-made gown it was the one luxury she had permitted herself from her salary for the demands were legion Today there was a flush on her cheeks from the bracing air and as she stood before them the dingy room seemed suddenly bright she looked again the queen of the prairie guess who i've seen they only looked at her rejoiced to see the brightening of her face well guess it's somebody from kansas lieutenant tigerman hazarded miss nanny no nor jennison it is somebody you really would like to see then he wasn't from kansas said miss nanny grimly i never want to see a living creature from kansas again not even a dog i would know he was around after a bone and would get it you are safe this time aunt nan it was dr cheever dr cheever it was evident from the simultaneous exclamation of pleasure that some good could come out of nazareth what is he doing here asked mrs trevelyan he is here with his regiment the something kansas i forget what but it is not the seventh i know that much thank the lord ejaculated miss nanny they were very glad to see him when he came it seemed like a page out of the old life dr cheever came often to poverty hollow he came sometimes on weekdays when virginia was off leading her little band up the thorny path that leads to knowledge but he came always on saturday it is undeniable that he brightened life for the girl not a little that winter with walks and talks and horseback rides and drives to and from her school but it must be said that she paid the debt for she irradiated it for him since he had seen her she had passed from joyous girlhood to womanhood she was more dignified and serious than he had thought she would ever be but she had been through enough to sober her he thought they talked much about the prairie but only once did dr cheever ask about gordon that he suspected anything about their previous relations virginia could only surmise from his not asking however gordon was in kentucky when he was at keswick and perhaps he thought nothing about him but one day he asked where he was and if they had ever heard from him no virginia said she did not know where he was in kansas city she believed they never heard from him the war had made many changes in friendships he looked at her keenly the war hadn't made much difference with theirs one friday afternoon after some months of this pleasant intercourse they were driving in from virginia's country boarding place a half mile or so from town the road over which they were passing forked the one to the right going around the hills by circuitous windings and into jefferson city from the east the other straight to town dr cheever had something to say to virginia for his regiment had been ordered away and he had planned to say it not too far from the fork then he could take either road he had been preoccupied all during the drive virginia had most of the talking to do and she was beginning to wonder why they were about a mile from the fork of the road when dr cheever said almost abruptly miss virginia did you know that gordon lay and i are old acquaintances why no she said in great surprise where did you know gordon lay i thought you had never met i know him well at pittsburgh landing i believe before god he saved my life i was left on the field for dead but he found me and had me cared for they said it wasn't worth while to move me but he said it was and he was right i heard you tell about that said virginia wonderingly but i never dreamed that it was gordon it was then we were together before corinth and got to be the best of friends you know war sometimes makes as well as breaks friendships he is a fine fellow 
but it is so strange you didn't tell us she said i asked you about him one day and i thought from the way you answered that it was not a pleasant subject to you so i said nothing more about it well a week ago i had a letter from him that i think you ought to know about virginia's hands were clenched tight under the lap robe and her heart was throbbing as if it would burst i wrote to him about you and about me she cried turning upon him the danger signal was fluttering in her cheeks now and he said hastily don't be angry with me let me explain before you say anything at all won't you go on she said shutting her lips tight when we were down there in camp we were together a great deal gordon and i especially after i found who it was that had refused to let me die and naturally we talked much about the prairie and keswick and all of you you know those things seem pretty close to a man when he is likely to go to the battlefield any day and not come away he never told me whether there was anything between you or not i often wanted to ask but of course i knew he thought a great deal of you and that he got letters from you for he did tell me that he used to read parts of them to me where you told what the kansas soldiers did i knew a part of that story before it was told to me here virginia sat perfectly still well when i asked you about him you told me you never heard from him and i knew then that either something had come between you or that it had just been a friendly correspondence that had died out but virginia virginia started he had never called her by her name before but he was too much in earnest to notice her the time had come when i had to know gordon lay was my friend i owed him my life not even for love of you would i be disloyal to him if what had come between you was some foolish estrangement i could not take advantage of it to ask the thing i wanted to know but if i had been mistaken then it was everything to me to know it i wrote to him and asked him plainly if he had any claim upon you that i his friend was in honor bound to respect virginia forgive me i did it because i loved you she was looking straight ahead she did not dare to turn toward him for her eyes were brimming with tears oh why were things so at cross purposes in this world why could she not return the love of this man this honourable high-minded gentleman he took a letter from his breast pocket and gave it to her she opened it slowly it seemed ages since she had seen that writing the letter was brief in regard to the question you asked me it said after some expression of pleasure at hearing from you again i will simply say that i have no claim whatever upon virginia trevelyan it seemed for a moment as if her heart stood still you are as free to speak as she to answer that was all she read it over three times before she spoke then she turned to him with a composure that surprised herself she almost felt that she was somebody else and she had a strange feeling of pity for that other self he is quite right she said in an even tone there is nothing whatever between us was it tally rand that said speech was given for the purpose of concealing thought as virginia trevelyan spoke these words her heart was throbbing a denial and her whole soul protesting there is there is they were nearing the fork the last barrier was down and dr cheever spoke virginia hardly remembered afterward what he said she tried to think the next day and could not for pounding and pounding and pounding on the delicate nerves of hearing above all his tender words was gordon's curt renunciation i have no claim whatever on virginia trevelyan it was true 
he had no claim he had forfeited it she herself had severed their bonds when she returned his unopened letters in that contemptuous fashion she would do it again she would do it tomorrow but in all this wretched business virginia had felt that she was renouncing gordon and she had been upheld in it all by a stern sense of right she was not aware that she was bolstered up by anything else but now for sometimes a lightning flash lays our souls bare to ourselves she knew that the thought of gordon's renouncing her had never occurred to her when it did she felt bereft virginia will you not speak to me they were at the fork now virginia spoke and he took the left-hand road end of chapter 42 recording by john brandon chapter 43 of order number 11 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon order number 11 by carolyn abbott stanley chapter 43 the scent of a honeysuckle when dr cheever's regiment was ordered away as it was soon after this they all had a sense of loss poverty hollow seemed gloomier than ever without his visits virginia had to fall back upon dr mayo for companionship and really just at this time it was more in keeping with her feelings to be with him than with a younger man he was her father's friend and he was such a good friend he had even found colonel trevelyan work to do when he was able to do it he was a cultivated man of education and refinement and was old enough for her to feel perfectly free from restraint in his presence it rested her to talk with him she used to say he was so intelligent and so sensible it was certainly a fortunate thing for her that he could stop by for her on his way home every friday it did not occur to virginia to wonder at a periodicity in his patient that required a doctor's attention once a week or to inquire whether he gave quinine for it the truth was she had never looked upon him in any other light than that of a valued family friend her intercourse with him was a tonic to her and virginia needed a tonic she learned to look forward to those rides and was almost her old self as she chatted at his side or talked seriously to him of life's deeper things it gave him a marvellous opportunity to see her at her best and dr mayo was a widower one friday in the spring when the trees were putting on their first green and the maples were still in old rows colonel trevelyan came out for her they were halfway home before she knew what had really brought him my daughter he said after a pause in the conversation i want to talk with you about a matter that is very near to my heart will you hear me patiently until i'm through she looked at him wonderingly why certainly father anything that is near your heart is near mine too it is not about myself virginia it is about you about me what is it virginia dr mayo is a very dear friend of mine i knew him when i was in the legislature knew him well he is a man of sterling worth i know it father and he has been so good to me this winter he is the dearest man i'm very glad to know you feel so it makes it easy to say what is on my heart virginia dr mayo has asked my permission to address you father the cry came from her as if she had been wounded her first feeling was one of bitter loss the next a strange repulsion yes he would not speak to you until he knew he had my consent it is a custom i like it guards a woman from unwelcome suitors virginia did not answer she was thinking with poignant remembrance of a certain youthful love whose exuberance did not wait for stately conventionalities or go-betweens virginia in years past i had hoped he spoke hesitatingly he knew he was on thin ice 
in fact dr lay and i had spoken together about it will never be father ah uh, i thought perhaps you might feel so i am not sure but you are right and yet gordon was a manly boy i can hardly think we won't talk about it father please i don't want to go away from you and mother why should i you are not tired of me are you he drew her to him my dear child they did not talk for a few moments then he said it is because of my love for you virginia that i want to see you in some good man's home it has been much on my heart during my months of illness i felt that i could not die and leave you unprovided for father i am happy teaching he shook his head it is not the natural way my child god never intended woman for the breadwinner her whole constitution and the bent of her affections proclaim that she was made for the home you did nobly in taking up the burden that your father had to lay down but it is not the right way it is not nature's way a woman should have a man's strong arm to lean on i would not try to force your affections my child but i should be glad to see you provided for these last few months have made me feel the uncertainties of life so and dr may was a good man as mistress of his home father don't talk to me any more about it now i want to stay with you and mother well well i only wanted to prepare you for it and tell you how i felt i should hate to see you spend your life in the schoolroom my child and dr mayo is a fine man the seed drop that day was left to germinate the doctor had the wisdom to keep away from poverty hollow for a while when he did speak to her about it he was very gentle she should have all the time she wanted to decide he said and virginia stipulated that for two months it should not be referred to between them miss nanny was the doctor's open ally i'm never gonna marry anybody said virginia to her one day as they sat together i'm going to be a dear sweet old maid like you aunt nan and live with beverly and be another mother to his children as you have been to us virginia said miss nanny seriously i want a better fate for you than an old maid's life not that i haven't been content child for i have but a solitary life is always more or less a lonely one aunt nan have you been lonely hardly lonely but virginia i will say to you what i have never said to any living soul before and wouldn't today under any other circumstances a woman is always lonely in a way who does not feel herself the supreme object of somebody's affection she may not acknowledge it but that does not change the fact i have been blessed beyond most solitary women i have never been made to feel my dependence i have never felt that i was alone but in whose affections am i first aunt nan you know how we all love you cried virginia reproachfully i do know i'm not complaining but virginia it never quite satisfies a woman's heart to be second don't forget that and if she has not husband and children she must be they sat in silence a moment and then miss nanny said impulsively verge i'm old enough now to say what i please that's one nice thing about getting old and about the only one i know of and i'm going to do it there is in every woman's heart that which cries out for the close intimate companionship of some other soul they may say it isn't so but it is and that isn't all deep down in every true woman's heart is a longing for the touch of little hands nothing else satisfies the mother instinct within her you hear people talk sometimes as if they thought this was immodest immodest it is the holiest feeling of a woman's nature but if an unmarried woman dares to express it she is called a lovesick old maid so they simply stifle the feeling and try to live it down i know aunt nan said virginia wonderingly i never knew you felt that way no of course not i don't go around proclaiming my deepest feelings from the housetops i only say it to you now because i don't want you to get the notion in your head of being an old maid 
i know they are useful i certainly am not decrying old maids but honey i don't want you to be one i want you to have the fullest possible life and that will not be in beverly's home but in your own there is something in being the mistress of your own establishment it gives you a place in the world and nothing else does oh yes i know that is a secondary thing but it is something virginia did not seem specially responsive and miss nanny looked at her keenly virginia there is one thing i want to ask you don't do it aunt nan i wouldn't answer you honey you are sure it never will be never then think seriously of this other you like dr mayo that feeling may grow into something deeper and stronger and i will give you another piece of old maid's wisdom girls sometimes let good opportunities for marriage go by expecting some prince charming to appear till it is too late too late yes too late you girls never seem to understand that there is a seed time in love as in other things and that time is in the spring as the weeks went by virginia pondered deeply over the question she was to answer she liked dr mayo he was never tiresome to her and that was a good deal of course he was much older old enough in fact to be her father but he was genial and companionable and he was not exacting he was willing to give much and take little so little indeed that she felt almost ashamed to think what a one-sided thing it would be from the depths of her heart she respected him would that in time grow into a calm semblance of love and if it did would she be satisfied and would he she sat down one day in her mother's lap and put her head on the shoulder that had sustained her in her childish trials mumsey you are the only one that isn't trying to get rid of me what would you do mrs trevelyan held her close follow your own heart my child you may be sure that will never take you wrong virginia had a letter one day from sally who was still in kentucky telling him about gordon's being stationed near them and seeing so much of him at the close of the letter she wrote verge what did you do to gordon he won't tell me but i know you did something he's been very attentive to mary matterson who is quite a belle everybody thinks they're engaged but i'm sure i don't know virginia put on her prettiest dress that evening when dr mayo came he never saw her brighter or more beautiful there was a differential gentleness in his manner to her that touched her heart to-night as it had never done before under all that gaiety that heart was a little sore a wound cannot be jarred too rudely when the bandage is just taken off the very night before her probation ended virginia and miss nanny were out walking high street was abloom with roses and syringas and all the rest they were not talking much miss nanny had said weeks ago all she had to say but the time for the verdict was at hand and virginia was summing up the arguments it was such a comfort to be with aunt nan and not have to talk they passed an old-fashioned double brick house with sharp dormers in front over the porch was a sweet-scented honeysuckle the air was heavy with its perfume there is something about an odor more than anything in the world that brings back old memories for one brief instant virginia closed her eyes the lights were gleaming from open casements the music of familiar voices reached her ear and the soft tread of shuffling feet the promenaders paced back and forth and under the honeysuckle a tall man held a girl's beating heart to his she drew a quivering breath i can't do it aunt nan she said end of chapter forty three recording by john brandon chapter forty four of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon 
Order Number Eleven by Carolyn Abbott Stanley. Chapter Forty Four, Without Fear and Without Reproach. Was it the honeysuckle, or was it the force of a great heart hundreds of miles away, that held and drew her periodically to itself, as the moon holds and draws in spite of all the restless, heaving, turbulent ocean? That heart though sorely wounded was unchanged this was the love of a lifetime to gordon lay in it was what the author of tess calls a substratum of everlastingness and yet in a heart where burns a steady flame of love that nothing can put out sometimes smoulders also a slow fire of resentment that is as hard to quench the very traits that make the one possible make the other almost inevitable gordon felt not unnaturally that he had been hardly used to the astonished bewilderment of that first moment when his letters had dropped unopened into his hands had succeeded a period of searching self-examination what had he done he knew virginia too well to believe that this was a girl's whim she was not unreasonable something had shaken her soul to its depths to lead her to do a thing like this but what was it and how could he ever find out in those letters was the explanation of his long silence of his unprecedented and perhaps unwarrantable action in taking charge of colonel trevelyan's affairs of everything in short but if these explanations did not reach the eyes for which they were intended how could he ever write himself in their sight and how could he make them reach those eyes the more he thought of it the more dazed he felt and the more perplexed as to the means of extrication then a slow anger rose within him a common criminal was allowed a trial and with those letters that would have explained everything thrown contemptuously back at him he felt that he had been denied a trial he had been condemned unheard he really was more troubled over the return of colonel trevelyan's letters than virginia's it might possibly be personal pique on her part though he hardly believed so but it would not be on the colonel's it must be that he had heard of his action in taking lois to the asylum and resented it perhaps the superintendent had learned where colonel trevelyan was and communicated with him telling him of his gordon's proposition to have her entered under the name of trevelyan and he had felt it to be an unpardonable liberty with his name perhaps they resented his taking lois there or of his having anything to do with it but he told himself helplessly something had to be done and there was nobody else to do it they ought to know that his motives were right whether his judgment was or not he began to feel sure that he had come upon the true solution colonel trevelyan repudiated this marriage and resented his action in the matter and virginia stood with him then pride and a sense of injury came to complicate matters if this was the way they felt he had overestimated the family that was all his regiment was ordered to kentucky after a while and he talked it all over with his mother asking specially that sally should not be told anything about it he did not want to be mixed up in it any more than he was already he said and sally would be sure to let fall something about it to virginia and in the wisdom of this mrs lay concurred so the last hope of straightening things out was cut off mrs lay took a very common-sense view of gordon's obligation in the matter influenced perhaps by mother-love 
my son she said i don't think you want to burden yourself in any such way if colonel trevelyan repudiates this marriage or is not able to maintain her lois should be put on the county mother he replied quietly that was settled months ago while i live beverly trevelyan's wife will never become a public charge but gordon there is certainly some misunderstanding i wouldn't give it up this way and when you write again i shall not write again he said it was during this time in kentucky that he met mary matterson of whom sally afterward wrote to virginia he did not go much into society but mary matterson was a sweet attractive girl and he went often to her house she was a belle as sally had said but there was something about this reserved quiet man that interested her more than any of her gay companions and he found her companionship very grateful at this time word came to him at last that the news of beverly's death had reached the trevelyans came in a heartbroken letter from virginia to sally which she put into gordon's hands gordon she cried through her tears what was it came between you and verge write to her whatever it was she needs comfort now he read the letter through and handed it back to her but he did not answer and he did not write in all the letters of sympathy that passed there was never a mention of the marriage one day gordon had a letter from dr cheever it was written with a longing for a friend's sympathy and perhaps too with the unformulated thought that gordon would understand he told him in the letter what she had said the assurance he had waited for before he had spoken there is nothing whatever between us gordon sat staring into vacancy a long time after he read this letter it seemed to make it all so horribly definite this is a mixed-up world he did not know that her words were only an echo of his own that had fallen on her heart like clods on a coffin after a while his eyes fell on another letter lying on his table he took it up and looked at it he knew what it was it seemed almost like the satire of fate that it should have come at this moment when he was looking out over the desolation of his life it was a bill for lois chandler's board and medical attendance rendered quarterly with it was a brief statement of her condition which the superintendent said was unchanged gordon had deposited a sum of money in the fulton bank in case of emergency he wrote out a check for the amount added a formal line with it and addressed it mechanically he was thinking of the day he stood under the willow tree with beverly trevelyan's letter in his hand the covenant was with jonathan and his house he said unaware that he had spoken his mother was well provided for she would never leave his sister now and wifeless and childless as he felt at this moment he should always be what better use could he make of his broken life than to give it to the care of his dead friend's wife and child i can at any rate be faithful he thought but it was a wintry smile that flitted over his face for a principle is a bloodless thing and human love so warm and palpitating and so it stood between these two until the hour of reckoning came end of chapter forty four recording by john brandon Chapter forty five of Order number eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. 
order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter forty five a day in june it was a royal day in june the skies were bluer the grass more green the very roses fuller and sweeter than they had been for four long years for it was a june of peace the birds were holding a carnival over it and all nature sang in the chorus these four years had been a night of mad delirium but the dawn had come men woke with spent bodies and racked nerves it is true but with vision clearer than it had been for many a day and as the morning brightened a thrill of life began stirring in their veins when the end came with appomattox colonel trevelyan accepted it with stoical philosophy we have fought a good fight he said to dr mayo who was a union man we have kept the faith delivered to us by our fathers but the logic of events is against us and we yield to it there was something in the attitude of the conquered that could not but appeal to the conqueror they had staked all and lost but they did not whine there are few things in history braver or more pathetic than the way in which the southern people took up life again when the war was over they were impoverished and decimated their lands were laid waste their pleasant places destroyed by fire thorns and briars sprang up where the fruitful field had been the fallow ground cried out for the husbandman and the strong man was laid low those that remained were unused to labor and their social structure was in ruins around them but men and women bent their backs to the burden and did not complain it is not strange perhaps that here and there one should see occasional souls who in the midst of the fiery furnace that followed war should still have been unreconstructed it is always easier for the victor to forget than for the vanquished and there were some wounds that need time's healing touch all over the country that june people were taking up the tangled threads of life and trying to straighten them out they seemed hopelessly twisted sometimes on the border the land at least was left and jackson county land with youth and hope is a fortune to any possessor but too often alas youth has gone and hope ah well happily hope is a perennial it goes down before the sharp frosts of winter but its tender leaves rear themselves bravely again when the first sunny days come there always seems to be some warmth where its roots are hidden it seemed to colonel trevelyan when the tidings of beverly's end reached him that youth and hope had been cut down together but by the time this june of peace had come he remembered that virginia was left and with the thrilling of life in nature came the throbbing of the old desires for home and the mastery of the earth virginia and her father had sat june first for their return to spy out the land and see what could be done toward building up the waste places they had talked much about it even sally away off in kentucky knew of that date and all it portended she was as eager to get back as they but she must wait a while till ike swamscott could get a start and come on for her the war did not blast quite all hopes those having their roots in hearts that still beat sprang up again colonel trevelyan and virginia stood on the platform of a missouri pacific station a friend's buggy was to convey them to grand prairie and the friend stood urging his hospitality upon them they did not quite have all things in common as in apostolic times 
but the returning exiles had a helping hand extended from every side a family camping for the night by the roadside in sixty five sent to a neighboring farmhouse one morning for milk the messenger came back with pans of hot biscuits and a generous dish of ham and eggs the housewife had given up her own breakfast and was cheerfully cooking another i have just got back myself was the message she sent and i know how it is the two were in the buggy ready for the start when a young man tall and erect rode up on an iron gray his face was bronzed from exposure but it was a clean face well chiselled they were not eyes that need fall before the most searching gaze they did not now they bent fearlessly upon the young woman in the buggy whose colour came and went why it's gordon lay exclaimed colonel trevelyan heartily extending his hand well met my boy well met it is a lucky chance that brings us together here it is lucky indeed for me said gordon shaking hands cordially with both he emphasized the pronoun rather more than the adjective which was only honest seeing that he had been hanging around the station for the last twenty-four hours sally had written him that they would be there on the first but he had decided to take no chances of premature arrival he seemed as much surprised however as they were at the meeting he was going out to the old place he said to look it over and see what could be done with it no in answer to the colonel's question he hardly thought his mother would ever come back the associations were painful and she would be happier he thought with his sister he did not say what he was going to do with the place he rode along by the side of the buggy first on one side and then on the other but he talked almost always to the colonel the garrulity of years is a convenience sometimes and to safeguard the friends bays trotted briskly along the smooth level prairie road colonel trevelyan felt his spirits rising as he looked across the great stretch not even the spectral chimneys outlined here and there against the sky could keep down the joy that rose in his heart at the sight of the old familiar landmarks he was going home and he had been so homesick for his farm it was good to hear the bob whites once more gordon he said that's a fine riding horse you have there i've been noticing his gates that isn't the one you were riding the day you saved virginia is it yes sir it's the same one virginia blushed and gordon bent over the horse's neck to pat him he's done me good service sir he carried me all through the war we've seen some hard times together damon and i he fairly stands on his hind heels when he hears a bugle or a drum he's a fine animal repeated the colonel admiringly i hardly know how it would seem to be in the stirrups again would you like to try it sir gordon asked eagerly i'll change with you if you like virginia sat in quiescence her permission to this arrangement had not been asked apparently she was not considered in it when the change was made the colonel rode off briskly the blood coursing in his veins faster than it had done for years it was not running slowly in gordon's veins if heartbeats were any indication he was afraid virginia would see them yes he repeated damon has done me good service in his heart he was thinking and never better than just now his manner put her instantly at ease the old familiar boy and girl footing was established between them without a word he talked to her about her mother her school her life in jefferson sally and the rest of the boys and girls everything except the one thing nearest his heart she said to herself he has forgotten i am so glad and by a strange contrariety of woman nature said it with an inward sob imperceptible to the ears of sense they were talking at last of beverly's death he listened for some word that would tell him she knew of the marriage but none came it was all about brother and the pity of it nothing about brother's wife and the pity of that he did not want to enter upon that story he felt a strong shrinking from it for he knew it would hurt her 
but they were nearing home now he could not let her drop into that tragedy wholly unprepared virginia he said reining the horses into a walk they had passed colonel trevelyan who had stopped to talk with an acquaintance on the road how much do you know about beverly what have you heard it was painfully abrupt he knew it but he did not know how to soften it she looked at him uncomprehendingly how much do i know she repeated why we don't know anything much of the details mr forey heard mammy tell about his death when she was at the provost's in independence once he said she asked some of them to send us word and he did as soon as he found out where we were but that was not till a long time afterward you know mammy and uncle reuben can't write and there was hardly anybody left that they could get to write for them he was listening intently evidently she did not know why do you ask she asked suddenly verge he said very gently dropping into the old name unconsciously are you strong enough and brave enough to bear up under something i have to tell you she looked at him with dilating eyes what is it tell me quickly beverly was married married brother no he was married to whom to lois chandler lois chandler it seemed to the girl that the blood was leaving even her heart the hand clutched her throat frightfully where is lois chandler she asked in the asylum at fulton it is a sad story the night beverly was buried his child was born the mother has been insane ever since beverly's child she raised her hand to her throat and pulled at her collar it did seem as if she would suffocate who took her to the asylum she asked in a tense voice i did there was no one else to do it and i felt that she must have treatment i know it seems almost unjustifiable but this is my warrant for doing it he took beverly's letter from his pocket and put it into her hands she read it through twice why were we not told of this before she asked as she gave it back to him her voice was strained and unnatural he felt that he was being arraigned he folded it up and put it away before he answered when he did his voice was absolutely without trace of emotion i wrote your father about it and enclosed a letter that beverly had left for him it was returned to me a piece of paper that had caught in the wheel went around again and again and again she watched for its revolutions with fascinated eyes that were not consciously looking at it in her brain was throbbing tumultuously the thought this is the man i doubted and deep down in her heart there was running an undercurrent from sally's letter everybody thinks they are i'm sure i don't know virginia he said i hope i have not done wrong to tell you this i felt that you must know it first for your father's sake she looked up at him with a face whose white wretchedness haunted him for days he longed to take her in his arms and comfort her but he did not so much as touch her hand no she said with slow emphasis that he did not fathom then no you have done nothing wrong nothing you have been all that is good and true he raised his hand deprecatingly i could not have done less beverly left her to me and i loved him like a brother they could hear damon's hoofbeats behind them the colonel would soon be there gordon she said hastily where is the child did it live yes mammy has it he is a beautiful boy virginia we will see him in a few minutes he is beverly's image i must tell father she gasped the shock would be too much for him give me the letter 
he slipped it into her hand and reined up the horses now colonel he said cheerfully if you will change i will ride on ahead and tell mammy you are coming as the colonel was dismounting gordon bent over virginia you've been a brave girl he whispered be brave still the tenderness of his voice thrilled her under the willow gordon finished the story it was hard for the proud-spirited old man to accept it and he a trevelyan he said he died as a trevelyan should sir gordon answered firmly he came to her in an hour of need he was faithful unto death mammy was coming across the garden with a white-robed figure in her arms virginia was beside her they had kept the child out of sight purposely until now give him time gordon had said the two women stood beside them without a word colonel trevelyan looked up and started he was so like beverly but he did not reach out his arms he could not bring himself to that yet honey said mammy pointing to the colonel who is dat my danpa lisped the child tell grandpa who you is lil beverly he said stumbling a little over the name but triumphant at last whose little beverly is you honey asked mammy the tears rolling down her cheeks danpa's lil beverly replied the baby with the slow cautious speech of a child learning to talk he had long been tutored for this hour is you here dat mars william gord done give you another child colonel trevelyan sat by his son's grave one hand covering his face which worked convulsively mammy put the child on his feet and he went fearlessly to his grandfather with his baby fingers he pulled at the hand mammy often played with him thus don't sigh he said tugging at the fingers here's little beverly is you my dampa the old man strained him to his breast yes he said brokenly god forgive me yes end of chapter forty five recording by john brandon chapter forty six of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter forty six the dove's call within the next few days the wheels of life began to revolve on grand prairie slowly and with some jerks for a good many cogs were missing and the bearings had not been oiled for a long time but with motion enough to show that some day when the gearing was in order it would go again colonel trevelyan and uncle reuben planned together for the fields mammy and virginia for the housing of them all gordon on his own place was busy battling with the horse weeds that had grown up around the house like a thicket of underbrush they were arduous days of making bricks without straw but for all that they were not without their compensation a community of interests and of privations as well brings us close to one another as evening drew on gordon would come back to keswick as they still called the ruins and he and the colonel and virginia would sit on the stone steps that had once led up to the porch and lean against the pillars where the queen of the prairie was trying its best to hide the scars of war and the baltimore bell hung heavy with its sevenfold clusters roses can do such a mighty work in brightening the face of desolation and then when the colonel got sleepy and went off to the loom house there were always several hours of moonlight left and gordon leaned against his pillar beside the queen of the prairie and virginia against hers under the baltimore bell and it seemed very easy and natural to fall into the old ways of friendly talk but it was never anything more between them always was the length of a step 
and a great gulf fixed in virginia's heart was still reverberating everybody says they are i'm not sure i don't know and in his was the ever-recurring question which was never answered why in all these days he had not asked her one word as to why his letter had been returned if he had meant to punish her he could have devised no more stinging way if he would only ask her about it she would think but he was too proud to ask what she had done had been unprovoked what she might do would be unsolicited and of course her lips were sealed she had never asked him about the kentucky girl though it had trembled on her lips a hundred times she had talked around it and given him every opportunity to tell her but he never had taken her into his confidence again and again she had said to herself i will ask him about it some time just in a friendly way we are friends if nothing more but whenever she started to do it the hand always clutched her throat and she could not get the words out it was all she could do to breathe when that hand had her he asked her one day to drive over to his home with him there was something he wanted a woman's taste about colonel trevelyan was going back the next day but it had been decided to leave virginia here with mammy and uncle reuben to get the schoolhouse in readiness for the homecoming that was to be the shelter for the present sometime perhaps keswick might be rebuilt but not now there was fencing to be made and stock to buy and ploughs and harrows and reapers and mowers and corn planters and wagons to be supplied before the house could be thought of in the meantime whitewash was cheap many a jackson county farmer who had lived in luxury before the war was glad now of a shelter and a bucket of whitewash they used it freely even on the tree trunks gordon lay had had a little talk with colonel trevelyan the day before he had asked him some plain questions there were some things he felt that he had to understand things could not go on this way forever it was the first time virginia had been over to his home at keswick the occupancy of the two old negroes had kept the place in partial order but at dr lay's there was nothing left but the house and the trees even the grass was rooted up by swine and the weeds stood high as a man's head around the house they had to bend them aside to reach the door they went through the house together it was forlorn enough but it could be made into a home virginia was thinking with a dull aching at her heart it was the kentucky girl that would do it they went out after a while into the yard down in the corner where the locusts were and the swine had not ploughed a seat scarred like whittier's desk with the jackknife's carved initials had been placed years before between two trees v t was on it and v c t and sally and g l in all varieties of type they sat down on this seat and looked back at the house it is rather a gloomy outlook he said cutting a locust sprout and slowly snipping the leaves away i am afraid it will never be anything more than a house again it will she answered quickly she'll make it into a home for you sally told me gordon i was in hopes you would confide in me yourself but it's all right and i want to say i'm very glad for you she hurried a little but she felt the hand creeping toward her throat and she would not have broken down for a kingdom thank you he said gravely how much did sally tell you only her name and that she was a great bell ah and do you believe virginia that she would be willing to go with me into this desolate place it will not be desolate to her when you are here she said gaily 
her heart was bleeding but she would not let him see the drops she could bind it up at her leisure he raised his hat with grave courtesy you are so kind to say so and sally well sally's kindness i shall never forget she looked at him with surprised eyes i am sure i can only conjecture as to sally's motives he continued doubtless when we get down to them they will prove truer than her facts they certainly could not be more false in reality sally's thought in writing that news had been i'll just make miss virginia see how it feels no there is only one woman in all the world virginia that could make a home for me here or anywhere and i've lost her her broad-brimmed hat had fallen back leaving her bare face to his gaze and he was looking steadily at her a crimson tide spread over neck and cheek and brow and then receded her eyes were on the ground i don't know what i did he said gently it was his gentleness that broke her heart but i know she was not the girl to do what she did without a reason some time perhaps i shall know some time perhaps she will tell me until then i can wait there was a moment of painful silence it was stirred not broken for a dove's moan seems the very embodiment of solitude but a plaintive note down in the pasture the sweetest mournfulest cry in all bird lore poor fellow he said he's lost his mate listen he's calling for her she flashed a quick smile of recollection at him through her tears it was what they used to say as children just then there came from far away an answering call so faint so low it could hardly be heard but thrilling with the same sad burden of love and longing she put her hand out toward him with a quick gesture her chin quivered a little she could not quite hold her voice steady but she met his look bravely perhaps they've just got separated she said softly listen she's calling for him too can you hear it was a faint cry but he heard end of chapter 46 recording by john brandon chapter 47 of order number 11 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon order number 11 by carolyn abbott stanley chapter 47 a chapter of beginnings and endings one by one the lights began to twinkle over grand prairie in the cabins sometimes or in little shanties near where the chimneys stood sometimes in the shell of the house that was then pioneer life began again and the people were very close to one another in their poverty the story of that coming back is almost as touching in its way as the tragical one of their deportation two years before there is something very pathetic about the beginnings of middle life or old age but there is one beautiful trait in human nature as time rolls on we forget the disagreeable and hard things of life and remember the pleasant and humorous ones we cannot help it our souls are fashioned that way he who made them knew that the burden of all our sorrows would be intolerable and so it is that when a company of those exiles get together now they always speak of the ridiculous figure they cut and the funny incidents of the journey and the helping hands that were held out to them on their return and not of the woes 
of it all these make only the shadows of the picture that serve to bring out the highlights and distance has thrown such a haze over it and the whole has been so softened by time that it seems now more a dramatic incident in a play than the sharp reality it was forty years ago in those trying days of beginning again they labored together to build up the walls and as in the days of nehemiah every man repaired over against his own house the similitude to the exiled jews did not end here for the years following peace were far from peaceful years along the border it might almost have been said of them as of the house of judah they which build it on the wall and they that bear burdens every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon the passions of men cannot be wrought up to fever heat through years of marauding and violence and bloodshed to be calmed instantaneously by executive decree war began early for the border full half a decade before the deluge came and it did not end with the proclamation of peace for years there were occasional wild bursts of outlawry which can be traced to quantrell's band the james boys got their start then on the other side of the line were ruffians who had been trained in the same school that they should immediately settle down into good and reputable citizens was almost too much to expect of frail human nature a taste of pillage is to the human tiger as a taste of blood to his brother in the jungle it whets his appetite for more so it is hardly to be wondered at that along the harried border peace should have been a work rather than an act as the catechism has it a few of the old families never returned but their places were taken in time by enterprising farmers who during the war had seen this garden of the lord and returned to occupy it but most of them came back sooner or later for there is a drawing force about the prairie as about the mountains or the sea to those who have lived upon it which gets into the blood and brings one back to it sometimes it was only the young people that came as in the case of the lays and sometimes alas it was only the older ones that were left to come miss tiny and miss tony never returned before peace came they had both had free transportation to greener fields than are to be found in jackson county or even in their own loved virginia true it was beyond the swelling flood but they had been through such deep waters before that when they came to the great river it seemed but a friendly stream which would give them passage to the land of pure delight sally came back one day with ike swamscott and her mother and it seemed to mrs trevelyan and mrs devereux that they were beginning life over again in their daughters there is something a little sad in seeing one generation step aside for another but it is nature's law and perhaps after all it is the easiest way for us to understand how immortality is brought to life for so it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end in a quiet ward of the asylum at fulton a fair-haired woman with childish blue eyes and a peach blossom complexion walks up and down the long hall pressed to her breast is a formless child whose garments are fashioned with care but never need shortening among those withered ones whose springs of intelligence have been tapped and the joy-giving waters taken thence she looks strangely out of place even the dull eyes look after her 
and light up as she passes she is like a gleam of sunlight in a place of shadows but it is sunlight falling on ice it is beautiful but it does not vivify the doctor is passing through she comes to him and says wistfully as she has said with each revolving sun will beverly come to-day not to-day the doctor tells her gently to-morrow perhaps oh to-morrow well i can wait one more day doctor with a pathetic little attempt at courage and it is to-morrow and to-morrow and to-morrow and he for whom she waits sleeps peacefully under the willow ah god sometimes mercifully takes from us memory and leaves us hope a sad case the doctor says as they pass on one of the wrecks of war she saw her father shot down and buried her husband with her own hands at a time when she needed tenderest care yes quite hopeless i think but the doll baby is a comfort to her and if the semblance of humanity can so feed the springs of maternal love which bubbled up for one brief space and then took hold upon eternity what could not be done by a sentient soul as water in a thirsty land so is the love of a child to parched and withering lives upon the blighted hopes the blasted plans the purposes broken off little beverly laid a baby's touch and lo the barren wastes were covered with budding flowers and spring verdure the child crept into his grandsire's heart and brought with him a throbbing of the old ambitions this was beverly come back to him his name had not died out life was not quite all gone yet could keswick ever be restored for his grandson it was worth striving for the boy never knew he was motherless three women took him to maternal hearts one for love of the son who slept one in place of the child that had never been and one because he had lain first of all on her faithful breast each gave him love in unstinted measure and so by a beautiful compensation that we do sometimes see in life there was made up to him a loss that he never realized relations were established with miss abby cheever in the strangest possible manner one that could leave no doubt in their minds about the kindliness of her feeling for them or her sense of justice she had been living in lawrence since she left the prairie she had gone unscathed through the massacre and still taught school supplementing her earnings by giving music lessons one day she had a note from a lady in the outskirts of the town requesting her to call she wished her daughter to begin taking lessons on the piano miss abby went immediately pianos were a scarce article in kansas then she often had to substitute a melodeon and then the name interested her tigerman was a peculiar name she had never heard it except on grand prairie when she entered mrs tigerman's parlor into which she was ushered by her prospective pupil a strange sense of familiarity stole over her where had she seen a wilton carpet like this and this chickering piano over the mantel hung a portrait in oil of a stately gray-haired gentleman miss abby was standing before it when the lady of the house appeared when she turned to meet her hostess that lady had a vague feeling that she had seen her caller before where she could not tell 
she did not associate her at all with a stranger in the trevelyan pew four years and such years had left their imprint even upon miss abby and then mrs tigerman had never really met her face to face which had been the head and front of mrs trevelyan's offending even her name did not betray her identity in missouri according to the custom of the country she had always been called miss abby here she was miss cheever i have just been admiring your picture miss abby said after the salutations and the business negotiations were over is it a copley mrs tigerman looked at her with sudden suspicion she did not know the copleys but she would take no chances no she said shortly it ain't it's a tiger man when miss abby learned that the trevelyan family had returned to jackson she wrote a letter to the colonel i want to tell you she said that virginia's piano and your father's portrait are in lawrence i am ashamed to tell it for they were brought here by a united states soldier but right is right if you will come to lawrence with a search warrant i will tell you where they may be found so the old chickering came back once more to keswick and grandfather trevelyan smiled down upon the third and fourth generations of them that loved him in one of the deep wooded ravines that turn into the blue a peaceful spot for such gruesome work there was found one day at the close of the war a skeleton the very clothes were rotted and dank but in the breast pocket of the coat was found a paper that produced no little excitement on grand prairie it was the marriage certificate of beverly trevelyan and lois chandler and was identified by the old preacher who had returned as the one he had written out for beverly the night he was shot it pointed strongly to the fact that this was his murderer there was no certain proof as to who the man was but the paper was found in a torn envelope which had on it the name e m m o the rest was gone it was believed to be amon's baird in the center of the frontal bone was a bullet hole the avenger who had sought him for nine long years had found him at last End of chapter 47 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 48 of Order Number 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Order Number 11 by Carolyn Abbott Stanley Chapter 48 her wedding day they were married one day in october out under the elm trees that were caswick's glory the sumacs had flung out their blood-red banner of defiance to the coming blasts and every tree and shrub had on a wedding garment the carpet on which they stood was like unto the field of the cloth of gold there was not room for them anywhere else the wedding feast was spread in the schoolhouse which was freshly whitewashed and gay with autumn boughs i ain't gwine to have no po folks doin's mammy had said i gwine to have de stack cake and cook de pig and all a ole abelmarl supper they let her have her way and the larder was ransacked it was an ideal wedding for there was nobody there but those who loved them and the wedding gifts were conspicuously absent but while there was no exhibition of cut glass and burnished silver 
that was over in the new nest which was the old nest made over that which gleamed with loving kindness and sparkled with affection there were buckets of lard and sacks of meal and homemade rugs for the floors that must be bare for a while till the start was gained and quilts that had been pieced from precious scraps and quilted for the occasion mr whalen's gift was a shoat and mammy's the old dominecker and two of his plural wives nobody on grand prairie had anything of value to give now but they all out of their own destitution shared what they had and so the beautiful custom that has been so debased came back to its primitive beauty only one handsome thing did they have that was a case of beautiful spoons marked virginia they came from lawrence but the case had on it the name of a boston firm with them came a note that virginia read with the tears brimming her eyes as they did that day in the buggy she handed it to her mother and bent over the gift it is very appropriate said miss nanny grimly that kansas should send silver to missouri virginia dashed away her tears indignantly aunt nan you ought to be ashamed of yourself you know he didn't have anything to do with it i know it said miss nanny coolly but there is poetic justice in it notwithstanding but when she read the note even she broke down they were for her home and gordon's it said from a lonely man whose life was deeper if not brighter for having known her and who wished for her every joy that the love of a good man could bring to a woman virginia said miss nanny brokenly i think i am a little ashamed that word lonely had touched her he certainly is a gentleman if there ever was one i can't see how he came to be born in massachusetts the guests were strangely assorted as guests usually are at weddings for them if ever we call the people we want not many of the families had come back to the old neighborhood and not all of those who had were asked some whose names would have been on the list four years ago were not bidden to-day and some were invited the very mention of whose names would have sent miss nanny off into hysterical laughter then those were crucial years they revealed character as well as made it virginia went down to toby taggart's and asked rainy to come to her wedding the girl shook her head miss nanny told me you wanted me she said she was evidently pleased that they did but ma she lowed he wouldn't want me to go he had been in the brush i s'pose i've got to think about that now yes she continued it's hank him and me's layin off to get married after hog killin time pa says he reckons it'll be root hog or die but hank's done surrendered now he says he's goin to work i reckon we'll git along i wish you'd come rainy said virginia as she started to go we're not going to have anybody but those we love but you know you saved gordon's life we haven't forgotten that yes the girl spoke hesitatingly it was a strange combination of circumstances hank her accepted lover had been one of that bloodthirsty gang yes i reckon i saved him all right enough and a dull red spread over her face i knew i was saving him for you with a sudden impulse virginia put her arms around the girl and kissed her good-bye rainy i'm sorry you won't come and her tears were nearer to falling mammy had a conspicuous place in that bridal party one of the beauties of an unconventional affair is that you can put people according to your love for them not consulting rules of precedence nor even of color unless you wish mammy stood with the family as was her right 
she certainly had established her claim and virginia wished it so i want her to be where she can see she said they will all understand nobody objected for as miss nanny said if anybody in the world is entitled to a high seat in this particular synagogue it certainly is mammy she wore a bright plaid linsey the first she had had since the early years of the war it was the gift of the bridegroom who having no best man or ushers to remember bestowed his gift on the best women as he said though he acknowledged that on that basis his mistress ought perhaps to draw straws with her for it mammy's dress rivaled the maples and the hickories for brilliancy but it was toned down by her white apron and head handkerchief and by the little beverly in spotless attire standing thus she gave the last touch of color needed to complete a picture the like of which is fading now mr singleton got back in time to marry them and mrs singleton to help dress the wedding hams virginia felt that she would hardly be married by anybody else and he prayed as she had so often heard him at family prayers that their feet might be delivered from falling and their eyes from tears already they were beginning to build up the waste places and restore again the walls of their jerusalem they had nothing to begin on but undaunted faith and the bible saved from the flames when the jayhawkers burned the church from some strange spasm of reverence or perhaps superstition they took the bible out and laid it on a stump outside the range of flame and there it was found the presbytery to which hickory grove church belonged had met for the last time down in lafayette county in the spring of sixty two a meeting attended by old people women and children says one who was there and full of sadness charity and devotion a sort of spiritual sunset before a long dark bitter and cruel night of three and a half years now the night was past and the day at hand and the little band on grand prairie was gathering its forces to plant the blue banner again the willow could be seen from where they stood under the elm but mrs trevelyan turned resolutely from it mothers hearts are always tender at a time like this and there must be no tears on virginia's wedding day only as the heads were bent in prayer nobody could see did she look at the swaying branches her arms were so empty now mammy filled the gap as the prayer ended she turned to her mistress hiya miss betty you take dis chill i gotta go mrs trevelyan strained him to her breast god had filled her empty arms never was there a sweeter bridal they were very fair to look upon these two he in his stalwart strength and soldierly bearing and she in her beauty out on the prairies the bob whites called each other to look and from the woodlot back of the house came a bridal chorus from feathered throats the sunlight filtered down through the trees and fell upon them in a golden shower out beyond the spread of the branches floating clouds cast their shadows on the meadow grass just as they used to do but the whole world was so bright to them to-day that they did not see they stood with their backs to Caswick and its ruins, the smoke-stained pillars, and all they stood for were behind them. Before them was the new home, the new life, and love. Age loves a retrospect, but youth looks ever forward, and God be thanked. And now the vows are said, the potent vows that hold the happiness of these two souls for weal or woe till death do part the benediction falls and out into the world they go one flesh instead of twain 
and in the heart of the young bride is welling up the jubilate tuned to human love and in the bridegroom's eyes a look of tender strength and steadfastness that says i will not fail thee love lean hard and thus hand in hand heart to heart and shoulder to shoulder for theirs will be no rose-strewn path they step over the threshold of the old life into the new end of chapter forty eight recording by john brandon Chapter Forty Nine of Order Number Eleven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Order Number Eleven by Carolyn Abbott Stanley. Chapter Forty Nine. Epilogue. the missouri pacific completed after the war's delays from sunrise to sunset border of the great state was bearing a train westward through old jackson there were many people journeying toward its ragged unkempt metropolis in the early days of peace far-seeing eyes had discovered in those hills and hollows the site of the city that was to be a gentleman was looking out the window as the train sped on through plain and forest the undulating prairies broken here and there by clumps of trees or threaded by willowed streams seeking the great missouri a beautiful country sir said the gentleman turning to a stranger beside him who had entered the car a few minutes before a marvelously beautiful country but can you tell me what those tall monuments are that we see so frequently in pairs they look almost like chimneys those are jennison's tombstones sir his companion replied with a smile jennison's tombstones a remarkable name what do they commemorate may i ask the undying infamy of the man who looted this country sir the speaker was dr gordon lay his appearance and the quiet intensity of his tone commanded the traveller's attention they are monuments to the stupidity that sent kansas soldiers to control the missouri border the man turned toward him with interest i shall be glad to hear more of this he said there there is another do you mean to tell me that all these are the remains of houses burned during the war i supposed you did not see much of the real thing in missouri when gordon lay's recital was finished the walnut trees of independence were coming into view he rose i get off here you go on to kansas city i believe yes the stranger raised his hat courteously i am glad to have met you sir your story has been most interesting good day as the train started on a man sitting in front of the traveller turned during the conversation he had had his hat pulled down over his face it won't do to believe all these old fire-eaters tell you about the war he observed significantly they don't know it's ended yet that gentleman had every appearance of being reliable the traveller said rather coldly he was mentally contrasting the two yes but they are prejudiced now he has told you things calculated to injure united states soldiers commissioned officers some of them the traveller shrugged his shoulders but if they are true they are all prejudiced the man insisted they are not reliable i know all about it this county was a hotbed of rebellion there was not a measure resorted to that was not a military necessity yes perhaps some few things were confiscated arms and such things but it was a necessity of war soldiers have to forage you know the traveller looked thoughtful i suppose there are always two sides he said still he had the appearance of telling the truth what is your name sir my name is tigerman end of chapter forty nine Recording by John Brandon. End of order number 11 by Carolyn Abbott Stanley.